thank you, Nina Marie, for uh, joining us and answering some of our questions. Um, and so I'll just jump right in. Uh, we were looking at your uh, the Rising Currents project that you worked on, but I think this question will also get into a lot of the other work that you talked about um, in your presentation today. Um, and so we were sort of wondering how um, your how that project, the Rising Currents um, project, critiques inert frameworks um, and systems of cities. Um, because it sort of poses a critique of top-down solutions by the government, um, but then proposes, um, which is described as dispersed top-down interventions by designers combined with bottom-up reactions. And so for me, I sort of have an issue with the top-down, and so really wondering if the top-down design intervention is truly a better approach than the top-down government um, interventions and sort of questioning the role of the individual in all this, the individual that's not a designer, um, the non-expert individual, and how the individual can really engage with the design process um, prior to construction and in a way that is not only uh, reactionary. Well, that's a loaded question, and there's a lot in there. Uh, we could probably have a 15-minute conversation just about your question. Which is okay. Yeah. Um, first, I should clarify that I worked, I applied to work on the Rising Currents project along with Chris Reed and several others on our team, and we weren't selected. Oh. So I have written about the Rising Currents okay. uh, competition as, and, and of course about uh, someone's work like Kate Orff, for example, mm -hmm. who. Um, was quite involved. So I was really interested in that as a venue in part because it made public and visible the designers work, the design teams work on a complex problem that affects everybody. So from that perspective I think the exercise of the Rising Currents project and the forum in which it happened is a really interesting one. So that's just a point of clarification. The second way I guess to frame the answer an answer to this or a, let's say a provocation for future discussion is to always um, provide the caveat that I have spent most of my adult life trying to move away from the binary thinking that says one way or the other way. We know that in a complex world that has multiple possible realities, all of which are potentially in traction at the same time, we need to find strategies that are inclusive and robust. So that means, by definition, we need multiple scales of operation. We need multiple voices and talents and expertise types in a, in a project. And so that immediately precludes a top-down design strategy or a grassroots, bottom-up um, co-option of a design strategy, but maybe not at the same time. Maybe they are different points of entry yeah, yeah. into a, into a, a system of decision-making. And I have always been interested in working with designers because you tend to work in a very fluid environment. You tend to be highly intuitive. You value your own intuition and you trust it, which coupled with the background in a kind of rigorous scientific framework, you have a really robust set of potential for engagement. You really do. And yet each of us, each of our professions tends to work in isolation. So. Uh, my scientist colleagues will wait until all the data is in before making a recommendation. Uh, their credibility, their legitimacy as experts hinges on that. Designers don't have a lot of time to wait for perfect data and frankly, at the risk of sounding flippant, you're not so interested in it uh, because it takes away perhaps from the freedom and the intuition of a of creativity or, or that the creativity can come from this. Mm -hmm. So some healthy balance and even if it's a balance that's in disequilibrium, that I mean to say sometimes there is a more heavy-handed approach of empirical science and other times there's a more light-hearted, um, intuitive and creative approach needed by designers. It depends on the project but without question in my practice and in my experience we need both, not either or but and. And so when you ask me about a top-down design approach, I'd say that there's no question in my mind that we don't live in a time where the grand designer paints with a magic brush uh, and creates a master plan. We don't have that anymore. The master plan is dead. Uh, the world in which I work is much more nuanced, textured, and is full of opportunities for storytelling and fact-finding at multiple scales and oftentimes within the same project. The second part of your question, I think, if I'm correct and you may have to remind me, has to do with um, 
the empowerment of, of your community for whom you are designing or with whom you are designing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So designers currently don't live in a world where we have clients that pay us, meaning a broad design-based team and even a, a research design team. We don't get paid to do two things. We don't get paid to collaborate. We don't get paid for the time that it takes to really develop a shared understanding and a shared vocabulary. And we certainly don't get paid to follow up, to track how a project is working, to gather data to determine how it's unfolding, mm -hmm. and then much less to feed that data back into mm -hmm. our vision or our living strategic document, right? A design that is unfolding. Um, our systems of procurement don't allow that. And so we still stick to the world of the magic money shot, the great paper master plan that is supposed to be a finite ending. And in fact, that's a very brittle way of doing business. I think you use the term inert frameworks. Mm -hmm. I interpreted that perhaps wrongly to mean a brittle kind of rigid frame for decision making. And I think we need to bust out of that. And we can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. We need lots of disciplinary types of knowledge that are um, perhaps a little promiscuous. They're cross-pollinated. They're a little bit um, rough around the edges. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, because I think we can develop a more rigorous and robust way of making decisions when we are inclusive and when we collaborate at the right moments, but still recognize the capacity of the designer and the designer's knowledge as facilitator orchestrator, mm -hmm. maybe curator, are metaphors we could use. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think um, you bring up a really good point about this, like, the idea of the master plan, and um, I'm wondering, I think you kind of touched about uh, um, upon this in your, um, in the ending comments after your presentation, and um, you're talking about the power of representation and mm -hmm. communication, and um, you know, people still use the master plan because mm -hmm. it's this understood way of communicating um, for also for maybe people who aren't in the design field. And I guess my question is what, um, you know, what do we use instead? And sort of what is the, what are the range of, I know this is something we discover, mm -hmm. you know, being in school, we're discovering this range of representation modes, but, you know, what is the, sort of, is there a way to find a communication, a visual communication device that also still speaks? To we must <laughs> find that, don't you think? Yeah. Because we cannot continue to perpetuate um, images of a static moment in time, yeah. right? The perfect money shot that wins the design competition. We all know what that looks like because you're taught by those examples. Mm -hmm. But those are stories in and of themselves. They're single windows of an imaginary moment in an imaginary project before it is built. Right. So those images, I infer, are ways to capture the public imagination, to inspire people to action, and in many cases to inspire money to flow. We know that when people tell us there's not enough money for a project, what they're really saying is there's not enough will for a project. Mm -hmm. And so designers are often recruited to tell incredibly powerful and compelling visual stories about what something might look like. The problem is those are flat. Even in the beautiful three-dimensional modes of representation we have, and even with 3D printing, uh, we're still st telling stories that are relatively static. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I look to kind of layered storytelling that has multiple modes of representation where a story is never told in just one image, but rather a series of layers. Perhaps there is audio, there is video, there are interviews, and there are exchanges of dialogue. Sometimes they're captured in just call-outs, very simple call-outs of what people who would be stewards of and residents of a project would think, would do, how would they mm -hmm. approach it. So I think that the there are multiple opportunities for a different, thicker description mm -hmm. in representation. But of course, I'm not a designer myself. I have no design training. And so I look, that's one of the, the great pleasures of working with you as a profession, mm -hmm. is that I then learn how to do two things. I learn how to help inform good design to make it robust and where necessary based on credible evidence. And at other times, to help crack open constraints that perhaps prevent people from understanding the full potential 
uh, of a design story or a narrative. So yes, there are multiple modes of representation. The, the, the master plan as an idea is terribly constraining. This idea that something is finished before it started, that it's not alive and that it's not, it doesn't have the opportunity to evolve because of, of course that is the world in which we are planning. And I think Suzanne um, Mumal, mm -hmm. your professor in planning, asked the question very well on the last panel. She too asked a question about visual communication. Mm -hmm. And I think she was thinking less about maybe the, the representation technologies and more about the way in which we collectively communicate across the disciplines to tell a powerful, compelling set of stories about what kinds of futures we want to inhabit. Mm -hmm. Because then we can make them. Yeah. But I don't know what they look like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we're trying to find that. We, we need to have an open collective mind to, yeah. to crafting that kind of communication ourselves across the disciplines. And that's where the agency of design is so powerful because you are trained to think visually, spatially, representationally. Mm -hmm. um, whether it is through diagramming or through mapping or through uh, collage and photography. The media are multiple, and the media are, of course, the message. This is the final. So we can go one final question to wrap it up. But um, another topic that I think is often put in conversation in the school, um, and uh, a topic in our school is sort of the um, the design process itself, and a piece of that. And I think that this has been a theme throughout is this idea of collaboration between people within the design field, but also outside of the design field, um, and sort of uh, creating new synergies between those uh, individuals um, and I'm wondering um, how you think this um, approach changes the product of the, the design process, the actual outcome um, and I guess also the, de the design process uh, itself and what that looks like. I think that's a very thoughtful question and one that maybe helps us to articulate collectively um, the spectrum between process and product. That They're inevitably connected and we typically I think, again, in professional practice, we get paid for a product, we deliver something, and the process becomes invisible. So while I can speak less to the product itself, and I'm, as a planner, and as someone who has basic training in the natural sciences, I'm very interested in how process is connected to product. Mm -hmm. And so I've spent a long time studying processes, processes to understand complex living systems and processes of decision making, which would include design and management um, within those. So I could say, and, and I would argue strongly, that landscape architecture in particular, I, I have less uh, familiarity with architecture as a discipline, but landscape architecture is by definition interested in process because mm -hmm. the material palette and the medium within, you, within which you work is alive mm -hmm. and constantly changing. So you are defined by process. And so I think the processes that you in, in, entrain in making decisions for design products have to, to some extent, emulate the living medium within which you work. They need to be unfolding, they need to cross-pollinate and hybridize to some extent, but not at the expense of rootedness within the discipline. And I think there is always this tension between the core and the periphery uh, that, that designers speak about and that I sense, you might say. And when working with design teams, I'm very interested in asking them routinely to document their process to the extent that's possible. Sometimes it's hard to uh, tell a story that at the end of the process sounds like a neat linear beginning, middle and an end, when of course it's highly iterative, there are many permutations and iterations of the thing mm -hmm. as well as the process. But where possible, documenting pivot points, thresholds, uh, changes in direction, how a decision was arrived at, even if it's in part intuitive, the kinds of data that fed into it, what you chose to look at, what you chose to reject. Those are very powerful uh, process, documenting processes that provide a, a more rigorous base for research and design. Mm -hmm. And where landscape architecture is potentially weak is it does not have a, a robust canon of research methodology yeah. or methodologies plural and you can shape that. So I think it is, there's a wonderful moment right now, particularly given the recognition of more complex adaptive systems within which we work. They need documentation. Uh, they need visibility, legibility, 
and we need to show what we're learning in, in how we engage with those systems and design for them. So the process is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a real moment for it. I mean, I can't get funding for research when there's no box to tick off <laughs> right. on research method in a particular <laughs> discipline. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere in my national granting agency, most of the work I do is collaborative, but landscape architecture is hidden on the other category of fine arts, which is hidden within architecture. Yeah. or vice versa, <laughs> I can't remember at this moment. So the point is, there isn't a recognized tradition for it. And maybe there doesn't need to be a box to tick off, but maybe there need to be several. And we need at least to be able to, again, be a little bit freewheeling with where we borrow methodological modes of inquiry from. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think we should start and we should document and we, we need to take stock of that. It, it enriches and thickens and deepens um, the work that we do, and ultimately it lends legitimacy and credibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. great. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's Thank my you pleasure. Know. Thank you for asking me to speak to you. Yeah, of course. I look forward to seeing the, the results. Yeah. I think you'll have some great conversations.